My name is Vitaly Chernetsky. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures and director of the Center for Russian East European Eurasian Studies here at KU. I am on leave from my director job because I'm now a fellow of the whole Center for Humanities, but it's a pleasure to step back into uh, these duties for tonight to welcome all of you here and uh, Welcome our guest, Professor Andriy Danilenko from Pace University, uh, who will be speaking to us shortly. I just uh, would like to tell you that we are delighted uh, you are here tonight. Uh, tonight is the second Pali uh, lecture of the, that our center sponsors this semester. The Pali lectures are lectures that uh, are pertain to various aspects of Ukrainian culture, politics, and society that are genu generously endowed by the Pali uh, Fund here at KU. Uh, tonight's uh, lecture is uh, possible thanks uh, to a very active and fruitful cooperation between several units uh, on campus, so it's not just a quiz event. This is an event that um, was uh, a brainchild and a love child of several units at KU working together. And those other units are uh, the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, uh, the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures, and the Department of Religious Studies. And uh, again, I'm delighted to see all of you here. And I'm going to pass the floor now to uh, Professor Mark Greenberg, a professor in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures and director of the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, who uh, will introduce our guest speaker tonight. Right. Uh, as Vitaly mentioned, my name is Mark Greenberg, and I wear all the, the hats except religious studies. Uh, I'm in the Slavic department, and I'm the director of the school, and also I'm a, a member of the Center for Russian East European Studies faculty. Um, and I'm delighted to see so many people come out here for a talk by not just a philologist who deals with the history of religious texts in Ukraine, but somebody who has a, a broad and deep knowledge of historical linguistics. Uh, we have a, a very rich offering in historical linguistics and, and Slavic linguistics in general. At KU, you may not know this, but we're one of the strongest uh, departments for Slavic linguistics in the country. And so we're delighted to have here one of our uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, Professor Danilenko. I'd like to tell you a little bit about his background. Um, his CV is very, very long, so I, I'm not going to read the whole thing. That's about 32 pages. Uh, he's a professor of Russian at Pace University in New York City. And he's also a fellow, uh, a research associate at the Harvard Ukrainian Institute. He ha holds an MA from uh, Kharkiv University in Russian Philology. He has his PhD in General Linguistics from Mo Moscow People's Friendship University. He's held numerous fellowships and awards, including Fulbright Fellowships, both to Harvard when he was uh, still uh, living in Ukraine, and uh, to Poland recently when uh, he was visiting from the United States. He's lectured all over the world, not just in Europe and United States, notably many times in Vienna and Italy, but also in Hokkaido, uh, Japan. He's authored seven books, uh, the latest one of which you can see here. And he'll be talking to us tonight about his latest one. Uh, before that, uh, he published in 2006, Slavica et Islamica, Ukrainian in Context. You uh, may be uh, surprised to know that he is also accomplished in working with Arabic. Uh, in which language he holds a certificate from his earlier career. He has also produced an award-winning translation of uh, Yuri Shevelov's hi uh, famous historical phonology of the Ukrainian language, which is over a thousand pages long. He translated it back into the author's native language of Ukrainian from English. He's author of many dozens of articles, and maybe even in the hundreds of them. I didn't dare count them all up. Uh, they're quite numerous as well as encyclopedic entries. In short, uh, one of the uh, most accomplished uh, linguists of our time in the Slavic field. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
intellectually feel intimidated after <laughs> such an introduction, and I'll try just to prove that perhaps your words, <laughs> that you were right. <laughs> that uh, yes, I'm a specialist in a wide, perhaps, uh, array of different, well, topics. But before starting my lecture, I would like just to thank definitely everybody who helped organize this trip and this lecture. First of all, uh, on the linguistics-related part, uh, Mark Greenberg, and definitely Professor Chernesky on the part of the center. That's my first visit, and I did not honestly, <clears throat> just a second, expect to have such a big audience uh, because the topic, as you see, uh, quite exoteric uh, because we are, I will deal definitely with uh, Russian censorship and Russian imperial censorship. Uh, and definitely I will talk on uh, the Ukrainian Bible in the context of this phenomena, phenomenon which we call censorship. Uh, I will tell you right away that I'm not a specialist in uh, the religious studies, not at all. And I'm not a specialist, I would say, it, in uh, the Russian imperial censorship, well, policy or whatever we, ca we can just combine under this umbrella term. I'm a linguist, first of all, but uh, at some point, um, basically two years ago, when I uh, came across one article which was published and authored by Aneta Pavlenko, who is a famous social linguist here in the United States. He authored several books, dozens of articles. She's uh, by origin from Kiev, Ukraine, but she moved to the United States, it seems to me, 20 or 25 years ago. And when I was preparing a talk for a conference in Japan, it was two years ago, and I was working on uh, Russian censorship and working on some texts which were censored and banned, for example, by uh, the Tsarist authorities, I came across this article and I found an interesting, by the way, this is in it, that uh, Russification or Russification policies were only partially conscious as far as the nationalization was concerned, never consistent and definitely not long lasting in relation to Ukraine, to Kazakhstan, if not mistaken, and to Belarus. I was definitely surprised because based on my background and my information, it was totally not true, not true actually. And I just tried to, well, and I will try today even to prove that perhaps this statement is partially or perhaps completely false. Because according to this author, linguistic assimilation in particular in Ukraine and other centers where national minorities lived within the Russian Empire, particularly in the 19th century, as you see, the, the assimilation was left to its natural progression. So something like this, oh, I like it. I would like to be, you know, assimilated. Why not? I'm, I'm okay with this. A relatively smooth transition, according to the author, was typical of the Russian Empire until at least 1830. And Polonized elites, okay, aristocracy, as opposed to Ruthenian peasants in the Hetmanate or the Ukrainian Cossack state in the 18th century, that was something typical of this conflict, according to the author. And she claimed that between 1863 and 1905, the authorities began to systematically spread ossification, administration, and education. So, before actually 1863, Everything was okay. If you were assimilated, we were lucky to get assimilated as much as possible, as soon as possible. Everybody was happy. Uh, I will try to prove, as I told you, the opposite. And if you're interested in the history, for example, of Russia, if you heard something about, for example, some policies in the imperial Russia, uh, definitely you will be interested in the following statements. That the policy of Russification toward Ukrainians and by default to all other national minorities in the 19th century, well, in particular, and their language has always been subjectively systematic, consistent, I would take, uh, I would put it, a long time and uh, conscious. They always wanted consciously to assimilate these national minorities, and it was just from the time immemorial, so let's put it like this. The prohibitive legislation was aimed uh, at a complete annihilation of Ukrainian as a separate language and the assimilation of its speakers. Also, the Ukrainian Bible, and that's part of my talk today, uh, including scriptural translations, all other translations, into Ukrainian and some other national minority languages, and the regional publications were not the only objective of Russian censorship, not only. And Russification was objectively hampered by limited resources, poor managerial skills and other factors as reflected in the implementation of the policy of Russification. So the idea of the following that 
just simply because they didn't know how to do this properly, how to assimilate people as soon as possible. They perhaps failed to do this, for perhaps, so let's put it like this, in the early 18th century, and they tried to emphasize and just to, okay, to concentrate on this assimilation perhaps in the second part of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, especially if you compare, for example, this policy with uh, some parallel policy, language uh, policies in uh, the neighboring empire, which is uh, Austria, Hungary, the picture was totally different as compared, for example, with this poor lack of managerial, for example, skills in contradistinction, as I told you, to Austria and Hungary. Uh, censorship of the word of God. So uh, just a couple of uh, ideas which I would like just also to emphasize on them and just would like just to show you that, uh, well, the Tsarist censorship was definitely aimed not only at these religious texts, but also at circular little Russian literature. I would remind you that little Russian, the term which was used uh, in Russia in reference or in relation to Ukrainian, what we know today under this name. So the relation between the punitive acts of 1863, 1876, and 1882, and the translation of the Holy Gospels into Little Russian, again I'm using the term which was commonly used by the Tsarist administration, was part of the global obrusievanie. If you're familiar with the language, or with the Slavic, any Slavic language, or at least with the Russian, so obrusievanie, that's well, a uh, noun derivated from a verb or which means to russify. But according to this uh, form, internal form of brusivania, it means imposed russification, because in Russian there is another term which would mean self-indulgence, or you're ready to get assimilated. They use another term for this. So if I speak about the Ukrainian Bible, I will mention it, I will try, for example, perhaps at the end of this talk, to somehow uh, place the Ukrainian Bible in the context of this censorship. So you will see that the problem with the Russian uh, Tsarist administration was what to ban exactly. They could easily ban everything, all kinds of translations, all kinds of literature, and they in fact banned it. I mean everything which was written in Ukrainian. And not only in Ukrainian, definitely, in some other languages, as I told you, of national minorities. But a vernacular-based translation, I will tell you about this because there was a vernacular-based translation, a, a translation of the Bible which was based actually on dialects, on some colloquial, okay, let's put it like language or vernacular. Or on the other side, there was a synthetic translation, yes, it appeared at the end of the 18th century, which I would, well, label like, well, a phenomenon which belonged to the trend which I call Europeanization. So it seems to me that when we deal for a different translation of the Ukrainian Bible, which appeared at the end of the 19th century, we have to distinguish between different trends in the translation of this Bible. It was very important, by the way, very important for all minorities, for all peoples living within the Russian Empire, how to translate. So there were two, as I told you, two ways of translating. Either using very plain, very common language, making it so close to all speakers, or you would like to synthesize and to create something which, well, belong to something which we call a lofty, sublime style, which would, well, definitely mark your translation as something which belonged to this group of wonderful translations. Uh, so take a look at uh, the first punitive act, which actually was uh, issued in 1863, and according to Pavlenko, whom I mentioned at the very beginning, according to her, that's the beginning of Russification. Before this day, there were no Russification at all. So take a look, but suddenly in 1863, they came up with such crazy ideas, take a look at this. So there was not, is not, it cannot be any special <coughs> little Russian language. And that their dialect, as used by an educated folk, has the same Russian language, only corrupted by Polish influence. That the old Russian language is just as, as understandable to little Russians as it is to great Russians. Great Russians, that me means Russians at all. Uh, and even more comprehensible than the so-called Ukrainian language. So it's very interesting that he uses, and this is the Minister of Interior Affairs, he used two terms to refer to the language which I humbly represent and my ancestry represent, which is the Ukrainian language and the little Russian language. 
which has been invented for them not now by some little Russians and especially Poles. So the Ukrainian language did not exist according to them. So according to the Russian administration in at least 1863, if you spoke a language, strange language, which they would call little Russian or sometimes Ukrainian, which was not popular at that time yet, so you're just simply a product of these, uh, well, zealots, Polish zealots, Polish strangely conspiracy, yes, yeah? so to create a language against the Tsarist uh, Empire. And the continuation of this, a wonderful uh, document, as you see. The political plans of the Poles, the greater part of little Russian writings indeed comes from the Poles, okay. Finally, the Kyiv Governor General too considers it dangerous and harmful to publish the little Russian translation of the New Testament that is now being reviewed by the church censors. And the last paragraph, the Minister of the Interior has deemed it necessary to license for publication only such books in this language that belong to the realm of fine literature, at the same time the authorization of books in Little Russian with either spiritual content or intended generally for primary mass reading should be ceased. So there is a contradiction even in this document, as you see. So according to him, there is no language like Ukrainian. On the other side, okay, you can publish in this language which did, does not exist. That's a contradiction, right? So publish it if you claim that this is a language, but only as you see something about fine literature, which is fiction perhaps, but no, no ever. You cannot publish anything if this is a religious text and if this is something which is for education. So definitely they were afraid of what? Getting people educated in this language. If you are educated in this language, then you have your Bible in your own language. So then who can prove that your language does not exist? Definitely everybody would claim that this is a nation. This is a language and we have the right to exist. And don't think that the minister was a crazy guy. Definitely he was very smart. He was a very educated, cultured person. Uh, well, according to uh, the system uh, which existed at that time. And if you Google, by the way, the name of Valuyev, you definitely come across some of those documents which are easily accessible online. For example, that's from uh, the letter signed by Valuyev, but which was uh, certified by a secretary. But basically, Valuyev did not sign this. The secretary certified that Valuyev gave permission, yes, to circulate this, for example, one of those notes. It's just in addition to this document, something which is written, as you see, in a wonderful handwriting and a cursive, yes, which was all, for example, Russian, they were proud of this, and right now all Slavic uh, speakers are proud of this type of writing. And this is, by the way, and I will speak about it later, that's another document which was issued by Peter if I'm not this uh, beta the third, I'm not going into, I'm not delving into details how many Tsars there were in the history of Russia, but definitely that's something which preceded this event. Uh, Valuyev, as I told you, he was a very educated person and he based actually his uh, edict or his decree on something which was discussed and published by some other intellectuals. This is a typical Russian intellectual at that time. Mikhail Katkov is a famous publicist, a famous well, literary creator. He was a well, prolific writer at that time, but he was obsessed with an idea of the Polish conspiracy. So he was afraid of all Poles because according to him they were just conspiring, uh, instigating some kind of rev well, a revolt always against the Russian Empire. Take a look at what he wrote in 1863. The Ukraine affairs became unwittingly a silent instrument in the hands of enemies of both Russia and Ukraine, in particular of the Polish uh, zealots. We can see in the Ukrainophilism an adroit plot, we can see here in a sad delusion and finally a pitiful naivety and stupidity. So if you defend your own language, you're stupid, you're naive enough. Ukraine has never had its own history, never been a separate state. The Ukrainian people is an authentic Russian people, 100% it looks like, an indigenous Russian people, an essential part of the Russian people without which it can hardly remain what is now. And the final, uh, the little Russian town has never existed and despite all the efforts of the Ukrainophiles, still does not exist. 
if I, well, if I go back for a moment, you will see practically the same passage, the same statements, like the language does not exist, the language never existed, Ukraine doesn't have any history of own or something like this. So I am not going to discuss definitely the foundations or some uh, principles uh, of uh, this uh, point of view, let's put it euphemistically like this. But still it was a commonly, it seems to me, common opinion or common just uh, view of uh, how you have to, tr to treat, for example, Ukraine, how you have to treat something which was called at that time, they didn't use, for example, the term Belarus, to those southwestern uh, territories which are called today Belarus or something like which we call today Kazakhstan or some other countries of the former Soviet Empire or the Russian Empire. And if you remember, I mentioned uh, uh, Valuya, this minister, mentioned the New Testament, uh, which was discussed at the time by some uh, authorities, church authorities, whether to allow this translation uh, be published. They were so afraid of this person. Take a look. <laughs> this uh, typical, I wouldn't say Muzik, because that's a Ukrainian, typical Ukrainian <laughs> Cossack. It's, uh, the guy is from those lands and from those territories which I come from. Although our, for example, last names are different because his last name is Moratevsky, the first name is Pelip. It's something Polish, something Ukrainian, because my name is definitely the Eastern Ukrainian type of uh, the, the Ukrainian last name. But they got scared because this guy translated several Gospels at that time into Ukrainian and he decided to submit his translation to these authorities. Would you please allow the publication of them? According to Ricarda Vulpius, she's a wonderful German historian who published her doctoral dissertation on the Ukrainian Bible, by the way, and the circumstances of uh, these punitive decrees which were issued in uh, the 19th century. According to him, according to her, Everybody got scared. Everybody was afraid of Morachevsky's translation. According to them, his translation could just simply instigate a new kind of a prison or revolt or something, which was not <sighs> positively, as you understand, would positive, positively influence the fate of the Russian Empire in general. But you would not believe me, he was an obscure figure. Actually, he was, yes, he was a writer, yes. But he authored some, something which we call burlesque works that's just for humor, that's just simply fun, that's using strange language, by the way. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot just produce these strange language and strange fanatics which he used in his, the titles of his works, but they sound to my Ukrainian ear very funny, very actually funny. For example, if you're familiar, for example, with Ukrainian, instead of Fransuz, he would use only Fransuz, and you can imagine what type of the translation of type of burlesque works he uh, authored at the time. Uh, I suggest right now, let's go uh, over some of those uh, translations, by the way, into Ruthenian. Uh, Ruthenian is used here as a synonym to Ukrainian, as a synonym to Little Russian. The point is that Russinian, the language which was used by Ukrainians and Belarusians in Middle Evil times, that's just a common term. So take a look at it. I'm just simply wondering, it would be interesting to look at what point the Russian administration, the, the Russian Tsar, decided to ban something and to press the Ukrainians with the publications. So basically everything which was translated from Latin was Slavic. For example, the Son of Son, the Book of Tabit, approximately 15th century. But different versions of these texts, they were, well, circulated in Moscow, in the Muscovite state at that time. Something which was translated from Church Slavonic, uh, Lives of Saints, different Lives of Saints, including the Acts and Epistles of Krahiv, which were, well, they were compiled and written definitely in non-Russian part. Definitely, it was Volhynia, it was the, the Ukrainian, definitely, territories. But what is interesting, the, they started censoring and banning, as you see, the Ruthenian translations, which were prepared in Kiev, mostly, by Judaizers. So that's Kiev, 15th century. In fact, yes, they were Jews, they had some translators, they were dictating to these, for example, scribes sometimes, how to translate some uh, 
texts uh, written in Hebrew into the local Slavic language in order, according to some author, facilitize the local population, making them accept Judaism or something like this. It was very popular, by the way, in Moscow and Novgorod at that time, but they claim that everything started spreading from Kiev, according to some scholars, definitely. Some other claim that that was an indigenous phenomenon. So, for example, the Book of Daniel, the Russians didn't like it because it was part of this heresy, well, heresy, part of this moment. The Book of Esther, which was translated from, allegedly, from Judeo-Greek. And uh, this is, for example, an excerpt from the Book of Tobit. If you're familiar with the chart Slavic or something with all the Russian, take a look at this interesting translation. Tovit pogrebal tila mrtvich i utru dilsia velmi, a prišet k domu podle steny you have the English translation. So if you read it definitely, that's not all church Slavonic. That's also a combination of radio of this plain language with some church Slavic words, perhaps some forms. But it's already just, well, it's an advancement. It's an advance in the formation of the language. The Russian, it seems to me, the Russian saw at least, or the authorities of the local church, Definitely, they were scratching their head. They didn't want it because they were in love with the church Slavonic language, with the tradition which they were culturing at that time, cultured at that time. Uh, there were some texts in, I would call, pre-vernacular Ukrainian. And it, again, it's very interesting to look at uh, if they were banned or censored by some Russian authorities. So the famous work, which is called and titled The Perisopnitsa Gospel, well, it's a unique, by the way, publication. Yes, that's the so-called Chetvero Evangelia. So it's a fantastic work. It's a combination of, uh, well, Church Slavonic with the something which we call Prostayamova or plain language, plain language. But this is not a combination of the Volga language. No, they were no Volga language. They were just simply something right in between these two high style and something which is low, low style. There was an experiment, actually. There is nothing like this, for example, in the history of some other Slavs at that moment. And there was also an interesting gospel, which is called Didactic Gospel by Mileti Smotritsky, which first appeared in 1616, which was published in 1616, in a little Lithuanian town, which is called, as you see, Vievis. I don't know how to pronounce it in English, actually. So it's part of the Lithuanian duchy, or the Grand Duchy of Lithuania at that time. So under Metropolitan Petro Mohila, who was active in Kiev, and this is the years when he was active, and under his supervision, they reprinted this, everything was uh, bend. Take a look uh, at the six, it's only one of those dates. They are not all the dates. 1627, 1627, the ban and burning of the Lithuanian didactic gospels. Practically all gospels which were printed in Lithuania, and Ukrainian was part of Lithuania, or Ruthenian lands were part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and later it was the part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Everything which was published in Cyrillic should be burnt. Can you imagine this? Everything. Unbelievable, but it was general practice, I know, at that time, perhaps. And uh, take a look. This is well available online. You can see the charter, which was signed by the Ta and uh, 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 Patriarch Philaret of Moscow. So that was okay. Then burn everything, which was published in this strange Lithuanian language they sometimes called the Ukrainian language Lithuanian at that time. Uh, such names, perhaps you know them, perhaps you, some of you perhaps heard, heard them, these names, Kirill Tranquilion, Stavrovetsky, Zizani, Tustanovsky, the greatest intellectuals at that time. They were active not only in Ukraine, they were active in uh, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, in the Polish Lithuania Commonwealth. Uh, Poland was in love with these thinkers, intellectuals. All these polemics were with these, for example, intellectuals on the side of the Catholic part of this state. Look at some other dates. Six, 1672, again, the ban and burning completely of the Ruthenian religious texts, all texts, by the circular and religious authority. It means that 
any monk, anybody could claim, okay, I want to burn it. It does not belong here because it was published by this strange, in this strange language, which is not uh, authentic Russian. 1690, Patriarch of Russia, Joachim denunciated all the Ruthenian books, everything, even by Petro Mohil. I understand that perhaps Petro Mohil is not familiar to most of you, but if you're familiar with the history, for example, of ideas in this part of the world, he was one of the greatest thinker. He was one of the greatest prolific religious writer at that time. And uh, some other dates, as you see, in subsequent years, I put only subsequent years because you have practically every second, every fifth year, they used to issue something banning or burning and giving some orders to, well, for example, to stop importing or something. But again, this case, they, they banned everything which was printed at the Kievan Cave Monastery, as well as other religious centers. If you go to Kiev, my recommendation, go to this Kiev cave monastery and you will enjoy the scenery, you will understand how they created, used to create these wonderful books at this religious center at that time. So my perception when I read, as I told you, Pavlenko's article was either she doesn't know these facts, and it seems to me she was not aware, she's not still aware of these facts and she's not familiar perhaps with some commonly well cited, commonly mentioned dates and some other sources which are available, which are accessible, or something didn't work in her particular case because she wanted perhaps to apply some social linguistic methods which work today, but she left something perhaps behind or aside from the point of the, well, diachronical, let's put it like this, social linguistics. But that was not all, as you see. 1720, the greatest star everybody loves, at least in Russia, Peter the Great. A decree forbidding the Kiev and Chernihiv presses from printing anything by the canonic church books so that, take a look, that's the first mention of no separate dialect, no separate language. According to Peter the Great, definitely Ukrainian already did not exist, uh, would be used in such books. Uh, and uh, he published, by the way, this decree on the interesting occasion because uh, uh, in Kiev they published um, a certain work which is titled, as you see, Menologion in 1718, and where they wrote specifically that the Kiev monastery was mentioned or written as a Storopigil monastery. There are several spellings of the Storopigil monastery of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. The Russian Patriarch definitely got mad. It's impossible because at that time the Ukrainian church or church which was active in uh, the Ukrainian territories, it was part of the Moscow, so Moscow Patriarchate. So definitely it, either it was a mistake or they did it on purpose just to remind their, well, friends and their, for example, neighbors that don't forget that we belong to another, for example, center. And all other decrees, take a look. Uh, again, they, they are not all of them. Uh, censoring the language of Ukrainian printed books, as well as the Russification of the Cossack gentry and uh, Orthodox clergy. Well, uh, I worked, for example, on uh, uh, the diaries written by some Ukrainian Cossacks in the beginning of the 18th century, and it was very interesting to compare the language of these Cossacks. They were just elite, they were officers, that's upper echelon, of, uh, for example, of the Ukrainian population at that time. So at the beginning, for example, one of those Ukrainian Cossacks went to St. Petersburg to watch uh, a naval parade, which was organized by Peter the Great or something like this. He was like a naive kid. He was so enthralled. He was so pathetic about this. Oh my God, I see all these beauties and cover and everything is going on. This is a great core. This is a great tsar. And everything is written in pure plain Ukrainian, which is basically my language which I would use. It's unbelievable. And 20, 30 years later, the same author switched it to a combination of Russian and Ukrainian words. Grammar was drastically changed already, and basically the syntax was different, and you would not even recognize the language which this poor person had just simply to switch to create. Some people claim that that was the beginning of the so-called phenomenon, which we call, well, a mixed a hybrid language, a Ukrainian-Russian language, which has its label surzhik, something which does not actually exist as a pure and uh, plain language. 
It seems to me the velvet russification, and I'm a product of this velvet russification as well, <laughs> because it graduated from the uh, university which was founded in 1804 in the city of Kharkiv or Kharkov at that time. And uh, also, if you can see 1833-34, uh, the Russian administration allowed the foundation of another university in Kyiv, which is today the capital of Ukraine. So it was not, it was done, it seems to me, on purpose, because why you would like to create or to found a university at the outskirts of your empire, I mean the city of Kharkiv, which borders with, a, well, for, for example, Turkic-speaking peoples and some other national minorities or some other territories which perhaps do not belong 100% to the Russian Empire. Why you want to create a university? The idea was very simple. We have to create all these cultural centers across the empire to make sure that you provide the education definitely in the language of the empire, definitely everything was in Russian or sometimes in German. Because if you look at the roster, if you look, for example, at the list of professors who used to work in Kiev and Kharkiv, it was 80% of German professors. Everybody was invited from Germany. So the education in German and in Russian. So there is no place definitely for any local dialect or any local uh, language. So I call it the kind of a velvet russification because basically they were russifying. I didn't ask them, for example, to bring in German professors. No, I was lucky to have them to share with me their knowledge, but they would like them to speak and use my language, for example. Here comes another interesting decree. So whenever you take a course of uh, Russian history, definitely some of you can come across in such a date as 1876. Uh, that's a decree which was signed by, a Rus by the Russian side at the time in a German city, Ems. So can you imagine he went uh, to a resort in Germany and then he suddenly decided to sign another decree which would ban again the Ukrainian language. He would not, he was so upset, you know, by everything which is going on in his empire. The printing in Ukrainian of any original work translations, including lyrics to musical works, as you see, it was banned. The importation of the Ukrainian language publications, anything from, definitely from Austria, from Hungary, that's, I mean, this neighboring empire. No. The staging of plays in public readings in Ukrainian? No. Teaching elementary and secondary schools of any subject in Ukrainian? Absolutely no. They even did not spear the Russian language publication, Russian language newspaper, Kievsky Telegraph, which was too mild, according to them, which was too pro-Ukrainian, pro-local in its articles. They decided to, well, to ban it together with everything else. So, no nothing, no music, no lyrics, no printing, no absolutely was not allowed um, in Ukrainian. Do you think it was all which you can come up with your ideas how you can ban a language, any language actually? No. The amendments, they decided to, well, to work on this and to add something. And in 1881, they are signed or issued some amendments to the latest decree. Ukrainian dictionaries could be printed with the help of the Russian orthography only. Ukrainian stage performances had to be approved by a censor. So if you would like to stage a play, you have to go to a censor. Ukrainian text for musical composition should be printed in Russian script. And the organization of Ukrainian theaters and performing groups had to be prohibited everything. So that's an interesting phenomenon, uh, using the Russian script, which is commonly used uh, by, well, scholars, and it was used, it was called in the 19th century, it's called Yerishka. If you're familiar with the Russian script, they have peculiar letters, which, for example, one of them is called U, which is hard to pronounce, and I know that all English speakers are struggling with the pronunciation of this sound, U, as I'm struggling with some other sounds in English. So they used to call it the Yerishka. So if you use Russian letters to render, for example, your Ukrainian speech, you're using not authentic script. So you're using something which deprecatedly can be called Yerishka. 
I have some other connotations with this, actually, in my linguistic mentality. Uh, but uh, I can assure that Yerishka worked that way, because we have the famous poet whose name is Taras Shevchenko. He used to write practically everything in Yerishka. And believe me, to some extent, I don't want to blame anything. His autography was more authentic to render the Ukrainian speech as compared with some other scripts which were uh, invented at that time by Ukrainians. Uh, it's interesting that <laughs> you would not believe so they banned everything. But in 1881, the first translation of Hamlet was published in Kiev in Ukrainian. So everybody was just simply scratching their head. How was it possible this Russian administration banned, banned at least three times and suddenly they published? So the idea is the following. They just simply bribed the censor. They gave me a couple of bottles, like, euphemistically speaking, and he decided, OK, <laughs> go ahead with this translation. But I have an analyzed this uh, translation in my book, because the second part of the book is on uh, the translations of Shakespeare into Ukrainian. You would not believe me that a fantastic translation, because it was created by a wonderful leading author at the time, Staritsky. And his translation is a unique one. And it's a fantastic. And also, the translation was published together with lyrics and music to these translations. So they decided just to write. And they, written, they, they wrote music with this play. So in the translation, you can perform it together with the music and some extra lyrics in Ukrainian. I'll take a look at this statistic. This statistics is overwhelmingly easily, it seems to me, convincing. For example, the city from where I am, Kharkiv, take a look. It's approximately, approximately in 1905, 1905, the beginning of the 20th century, they had uh, 340 publications in Russian. And as you see, they had already 14 in Ukrainian. Katerinoslav, OK, that's somewhere in, right in the middle of Ukraine, 267 as compared with the 10. The most drastic situation was, it seems to me, in Odessa and uh, all other regions close to Odessa, which is uh, called the Tavria. Take a look, 350 publications, newspapers, and journals, and everything else in Russian, nothing in Ukrainian. And believe me, based on some uh, memoirs written by people from these territories and from the late 19th century, they used Ukrainian as a natural language. It was their mother tongue. It was used commonly in families. It was everywhere, but not in education, definitely, and not at least in these periodicals. So it's, I did not provide statistics for some other languages. You would not believe me. But also in Ukrainian, they even published newspapers and periodicals in Georgian in Jewish language, for example. Some other languages were used. But as you see in some regions, there were no practically Ukrainian language publications at all. In 1914, they decided to completely ban everything. But not only in Ukrainian, believe me, also in some other languages. When the Russian army, for example, occupied Lviv and some territories of Poland at that time, they banned practically everything, which was published in all other languages. If you publish something in Russian, go ahead. If this is Polish, no. Hungarian, no. Forget about it. Ukrainian, Russian, whatever language you would like, no, nothing. It was just, as you know, the beginning of World War I. So drastic measures were taken at that time. So the culmination of the censorship. As you see, and this is I wanted to show you, and right now we show, I will give you a couple of uh, facts about the Ukrainian Bible. The laws uh, curtailed actually the development of the language. These, well, measures covered systematically all the public domains, literature, education, theater, the church, book printing, and periodi periodical press. And the low prestige of the Ukrainian culture was typical at that time. So people started feeling confused, sometimes intimidated, sometimes not very comfortable with the native language, which they use, for example, in their families. This is why they tried to switch to Russian, and they did know Russian. So the combination of Russian and Ukrainian, as a result of this, we have a hybrid, a mixed language. But it's very interesting that in 1907, 1911, Moscow fin finally, after all these hundreds of years, 
they decided, okay, if you remember this peculiar figure, Moratevsky, like Kozak-like writer, yes, who translated something in the 1860s. So they allowed to publish his translations. The translation definitely was slightly modified, but they published. But interesting, quite interestingly enough, uh, the situation with the publication of the Bible in the Russian Empire was not so much pessimistic. It was okay, because uh, in 1812, the Bible Society, which was uh, patented or modeled on the British and Foreign Bible Society, was launched and allowed by the Russian Tsar. And uh, take a look at these uh, statistics. For example, in 1826, the society translated, printed, distributed how many languages? In 26 languages for all nations, for all national minorities within the Russian Empire. But by the way, no Russian, no Ukrainian translation, definitely, as you see. The Russian Psalter was published in 1822. And uh, some other figures and uh, dates, uh, 1860. The four Gospels were published in colloquial Russian, or let's put it like the vernacular Russian. The whole text of the New Testament was printed in 1862, and quite a historical anecdote, yes, that the full text of the Bible in uh, vernacular Russian appeared several years after the publication Russian translation of Das Kapital by Karl Marx. So it looks like they liked Karl Marx, the founder of this Marxist theory, more than, for example, the translation into vernacular <laughs> Russian, which appeared a couple of several years later. Uh, that's an interesting anecdote, yes. Uh, but don't think, at, at some point, at some point, getting back for a moment to the religious text in Ukrainian, it looks like the Russian Empire was not on alert, so to speak. And they allowed publications, take a look, of some well, collections of sermons in 1849, 59, 59. By the way, they were published in St. Petersburg, but basically you could publish everything in St. Petersburg at that time. Uh, they're just quite innocent collections of sermons, but not only in St. Petersburg. Even in my city in 1863, if you remember the year when they issued this drastic decree to ban practically everything, the same year, they allowed publication, for example, of instructions in the Little Russian language. So it's again, again, that's kind of a contradiction. Either they were not ready to ban everything or just simply lacked some kind of uh, skills how to do these, well, effi efficiently. And uh, some other publication that they see, the year everything was banned, the, the language into which they, for example, in which they published this was uh, banned and uh, forbidden from uh, public uh, use. So, and getting back for a moment to the strange Cossack who translated, <coughs> who created or made the first translation of the uh, Gospels into Ukrainian, Philip Morachevsky. Yes, he did it in 1860, but, but the publication, they didn't publish it. Nobody knew practically about this. Everybody was in love with the translation, actually. There was a special commission a committee of a very prestigious philologists at that time. They were academicians, they were Russians, <coughs> but they loved the translation and they even wrote that this is one of the best translations and it should be done, it should be published according to them. Uh, that's another, for example, me, uh, image of uh, the translator in this image or in this photo, it kind of, it seems to me, a photograph. He looks differently, he looks like a typical Russian philologist of that time. So as you see, the translation of Morachevsky proves completely that both nature of character of the words, the quality of little Russian expression and so on and so on, it should be published. But would uh, the Russian Tsar, uh, would the Minister of Interior listen to these academicians, to these scholars? No way. Would they mind the uh, publication of this? Yes, they would, despite the fact that, as you see, translations into at least 26 languages were completed. Everything was distributed among all these national minorities in the Russian Empire, but only the Ukrainian language, only this language together with a couple of other languages, it was not permitted. There is another translation, and I'm almost uh, slowly getting to the end of this. Uh, there was another translation, uh, which was done by Pantelemon Kulich together with Ivan Pouloui, 
the translation, they started translating in the late 1860s, and uh, finally these translations uh, appeared well, under separate covers and then together in uh, 1887 under the auspices of first of the Shevchenko Scientific Society in Lviv and also under the auspices of the British and Foreign Bible Society. I don't remember the exact name. So this is Br British major society. The, but the point is, it was published, and by the way, the told, well, the complete text of the Ukrainian Bible in the translation of Kulish and Pului appeared in 1903, but this translation was never allowed into the Russian Empire, despite the fact that in 1905 they agreed, okay, go ahead with the publication of uh, another translation, but you cannot use this one. The point is that everybody knows that the first translation by Morachevsky was a kind of ethnographic text. It, it's a vernacular, it's something which is uh, not lofty, it's something which is closer to the low style. So the government decided, okay, it's low style, it wouldn't compete with the lofty style of the Russian language, never. The people would better read in Russian because it's lofty and it renders the essence of the, well, New Testament or the Old Testament rather than the vernacular, which cannot render the sublime, for example, text of the narrative of uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, strangely enough, by the way, that's the image of the translator. <laughs> Uh, Pantelimon Kulish, so that's the photo, actual photo of Kulish. Uh, well, okay, he was uh, in love at that time with everything which was ethnographic, everything which his Ukrainian history, so, but he was intellectual definitely, he spoke several languages, he translated so much, he was a, a prolific writer. And this is his uh, handwriting because in 1897, before the date when he died, he, you would not imagine, uh, he translated or he created a poetic translation of the Bible. So his idea, his intent at the end of his life was to versify the whole Bible, not only those poetic books which you have. Yes, you have prose books, you have poetic books in the Bible, but he decided to go for the poetic rendition of the whole Bible. He managed to translate several books uh, and uh, it reads fantastic. It's definitely, but it's not like a folk song, no, no. It's a totally different genre, I would say. He decided to make the Bible closer to the people, and he decided, and he believed that, uh, well, the authors of Old Testament perhaps would think in the same terms as he would like to present it for the Ukrainian people. Unfortunately, this versified Bible has never been published, and I doubt that they would publish at least some excerpts of fragments from this. At least there is no plan of uh, publishing this. By the way, that's uh, a small fragment from uh, Kulish, uh, Kulish's translation. That's from New Testament. And, uh, okay, if you're familiar with the language, so this is uh, the combination, it's a vernacular Ukrainian. So, Kaja Yumozhinka, Dobrodiu, Cherpaka, Nemayesh, Ekolodia, Zlebokis, Vitkelaj, Mayesh, Vodu, Jivu, and so on and so on. What's very interesting about this text, all his texts, he provided stressing. So, practically all texts authored by Pantelimon Kulish, the guy who, <laughs> whose picture is on this cover, provided stressing for all these words. It's fantastic. And if you compare this stressing with the modern stressing, you see the difference. For example, people who know, for example, Ukrainian, Charpati, I wouldn't say, for example, in the Eastern dialect of Ukrainian. Perhaps in the Western part, they would still use it, but I doubt so. So some, sometimes they have a very peculiar stressing. And basically, basically, if, uh, um, to well, summarize the fate of the Ukrainian Bible in the context of this censorship. So look at this. The Gospel translated by this Cossack-like translator, Moratevsky, yes, ethnographic translation. So they allowed uh, the publication in 1907. The Gospels translated by Kulish and Pului and the complete translation of the Bible was never allowed into Russia. And uh, the basically nobody knew anything about this. 
Strangely enough, take a look. The translation sometimes surreptitiously they would import, they would bring into Russia, and it was mostly used by some sects, in particular by Stundists in Russian ruled Ukraine. That's a very peculiar uh, sect which existed at the time. Uh, so the Ukrainian bio of Kulish and Pulyu, it was published in 1803 in Vienna, by the way, and never was published uh, during the Russian Empire in Russia or in Ukraine. And it was first published, as you see, in 1928 by the Ukrainian Union of Baptists and Russian ruled Soviet Ukraine. And later, subsequent printings, yes, they appeared. But the influence of this bile was minimal, actually. They, they didn't know about it, they didn't use it, at least in Ukraine, in the so-called Dnieper Ukraine, everything. It was used mostly, perhaps, to some extent in Galicia and some western parts of Ukraine. And just summing up, uh, because I don't want uh, to keep you concentrated, for example, on Ukrainian topics and everything else, it seems to me that the translation of this ethnographic translation was not the initial pretext or uh, the reason or propelling force behind uh, the introduction of this specific degree to ban everything which was in Ukrainian. Because, as I told you, something in Ukrainian appeared even in 1863 and something even later. But during the period from 1863 to 1875, definitely, it seems to me in trying to catch up with the more experienced neighbor, I mean the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian authorities decided just, okay, we're gonna fight against it, against it. They opted for some punitive actions. It seems to me the Russian Tsar was at that time just simply afraid of the competition with the neighboring empire to some extent. And he was afraid of these influences, Ukrainian influences coming from the neighboring empire. He wanted just to put a barrier, for example. No books, no nothing, no translation. You use Ukrainian in, in Vienna, enjoy it. But you cannot use, for example, in Kyiv or in some other parts. And the Tsarist administration was afraid of, it seems to me, of the Europeaniza or Europeanization, I would say, of all this translation. They didn't want the Ukrainian Bible to be translated in a synthetic language with the borrowings from different languages, from English, from French, from Russian, from Church Slavonic. It would be a truly synthetic language which could be compared to some extent with the Russian language, with the standard Russian, which is a combination, the basis Church Slavonic, with some of the borrowings coming from some European languages. This is why they claim we are so smart with our literary standard and your language, your Ukrainian language, is a vernacular. How you can compete, for example, in translating religious texts. And uh, finally, and it seems to me, uh, my colleague, uh, Pavlenko would not perhaps agree with me that the policy of Russification, not only toward Ukrainians, by the way, but also toward some other national minorities, always have been systematic, long time and conscious. And it's very interesting that this uh, Russification policy toward, for example, the Polish language was not systematic. It was not long time and not, was not conscious to the extent it was against the Ukrainians. Uh, because even uh, these translators and these author worked uh, in the Russian administration in Warsaw and he was fighting against the Polish language and he was even, uh, he supported even the introduction of Russian language in Poland uh, in opposition to the influence of the Polish culture and the Polish language at the time. So this is basically what I wanted to share with you and some of these material definitely is included in my book, so if you're interested in, I have some flyers uh, that's for colleagues in uh, adjacent fields, so if you're interested, you can grab a flyer, and perhaps somebody would like just to buy a book, I would be very pleased. I'm selling at the author's discount. It doesn't mean that I don't want to sell, no. I don't want to sell because I have a limited number of my <laughs> copies, but still, if you're interested, you're welcome. So thank you very much for your attention.